Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes. OK. Thank you for inviting me, Lakshmi. And I'm very excited about AWAKE and especially our fee program. So I'd like to begin just telling you a little bit, about, telling you my experience, strength, and hope. Um, having had some 30 years experience with Ibogaine and 45 years experience with psychedelics, um, why I think Ibogaine is so critically important during this time of the so-called psychedelic renaissance. So before becoming a physician, I had an LSD experience where I was dosed and did not know I was dosed and had a completely remarkable experience. Now, I was a young man reading all the beat books, smoking pot and into kind of, you know, I was born in 1955, so a little missed that true hippie period. But um, LSD confirmed something for me that I needed confirmation of, you know, I, I saw the sacred geometry and I went to chase that. And immediately after that first LSD experience, I remember the very next morning, a, a term came to my brain, which I called neuropsychiatric immunology. These drugs have ability to help people and heal people and there's a place for them in medicine. And although I had planned to go to medical school, my whole idea of, of during medical school and residency was to use psychedelics in medicine. And I spent some time living with indigenous cultures, uh, the Huichol in Mexico. And when I told Huichol shamans, so back then there was no internet. Shamans didn't have web pages. Shamans didn't advertise. Shamans didn't charge for treatments. There were no psychedelic retreats. Um, even to get to the Huichol, there was there were no roads. You couldn't drive there. You had to walk for ten days um, or fly in in a little private plane or something. And when I told the shamans the nature of my experience, it took two years to build up this trust. But I was asked to go on spiritual journeys with them called Wirikuta, um, being made a shaman in the Huichol culture. And I don't consider myself a shaman. I don't consider myself a psychedelic guru. Went chasing, went down to the Amazon in the late 80s, early 90s in chase of a drug. Back then, I thought it was called Yage. 20 years before anybody heard of ayahuasca. Um, yet, all those psychedelic experiences did not prevent me from becoming an opiate addict myself. And no Ibogaine existed. So I got clean the hard way. So I go to, I'm trained in internal medicine, um, did a cardiology fellowship, uh, trained in New York City, came down to Miami to do a cardiology fellowship. And seeing the way cardiology was practiced in, in 1988, I says, I can't do this. This is all wrong. Um, I spent the next decade or so working as a director of an emergency room, running code blues all day long, life and death kind of stuff, you know, gunshots to the heart, to everything from broken legs and these sort of things. And I really loved that kind of work, but it was fueled by opiate dependence, okay? I was a functioning addict. Um, seven years on a methadone maintenance program, you know, hoping that I don't get found out and lose my medical license. I'm married, children, everything. And one day a little voice in my head says to me, Jeff, it's time to get clean because your whole house of bullshit's going to fall apart. So having all this psychedelic knowledge did not prevent that part of me that was truly a genetic addict. The first time I did, and I messed around with every illicit drug known to man, the first time I did an opiate, I remember that very first time, like it was yesterday. Oh my God, that's the missing chemical. That's something's wrong with my brain. I was born opiate deficient. This is the first time I ever feel normal in my life. It was instant addiction. I remember telling my best friend, Richard, who passed away from with a needle in his arm, where do I get that stuff, man? I want more the next day. And he warned me not to, but I found a way and very quickly, my, that addiction escalated. Um, and the only way to function was to be a slave on the methadone line for seven years. And then I had this little voice in my head said to me, it's time to get clean. And every time I, I listened to this voice, because every time it told me something, it came to be. 
whether it said, you know, you're going to have a car accident next week, you better be really careful. Well, this little voice this time said to me, you're about to get like found out, you know, I quit my job and I looked at what the US system had to offer back then, which I might say this was 1995 was a hundred times better than the state of US opiate detox is right now. So there you could check into a detox and they can give you a real opiate. So back then I could have gone to a detox and gotten drugs like oxymorphone, methadone or oxycodone or dihydromorphone, which I believe is the best pharmaceutical substitution drug for detox. And still, I didn't want to be locked up anywhere and having somebody tell me what to do. So literally, I, you know, for me, Narcotics Anonymous worked. I went to meetings. I didn't sleep for 90 days. I got clean and I still, you know, work a 12-step program some 27 years later. So interestingly enough, uh, it's about 1995. I had a neck operation and a patient who was a woman healer was in an office. I started working part-time again, and I decided I don't want to go back to the emergency room because there was no circadian rhythm. It was an extremely unhealthy lifestyle. You do 12-hour shifts, here, work two nights, take three days off, work three days, work nights. There was, I realized that I hadn't had a normal sleep cycle since the day I started doing my residency. You used to be up 48 hours, go home for eight hours and back and with call and shifts and all these things. And I said, this is not a sustainable way I wanna live. And I've got to change what I do in medicine. And this woman noticed some Weicho art in my office wall and said to me, she had met a scientist from University of Miami in a place and the whole, even she had a dream about going to this place. She went the next day, bumps into this woman from University of Miami who says she has a psychedelic plant that cures opiate addiction. And I was like, right, I got a bridge to sell you. I, I know the woman, I know about her work. I don't believe any of it. I don't believe there's an instant cure for the 90 days of hell of opiate dependence. And now let's not, let's all realize here, for those of you who haven't been addicted to opiates, and I know some of you have, that coming off opiates is not like coming off alcohol or cocaine or even methamphetamines, which is extremely difficult because of the brain tolerance that develops a neuroadaptation of the brain. But if there is such a thing as hell in the Judean Christian model of whatever hell is, it's cold turkey kicking dope in, in a jail anywhere, you know, it is the total absence of any chemicals to protect you from physical and emotional pain. And most addicts who are out there for 10, 12 years saying, if I could just get clean, I'd never make this mistake again. What's keep, what kept me out there, I wanted to get clean from after, after a month I knew I had a problem. It took me seven, eight years to, to find the solution. And the solution was just to bite the bullet for me back then. So this woman says, I'm doing, I'm about to start a study in St. Kitts with this drug, come see it. Um, now, at this time, Dana Beal, who's on with us today, may be one of the few people who was around back then, but we were a small group of maybe 10, 20 people in the whole world that knew about Ibogaine. Um, we used to meet in Dana's basement in, in Soho and have meetings and talk to each other. Um, and the first time I saw her, I remember that first opiate patient had a $1,000 a day opiate habit, received a flood dose of Ibogaine. And the next morning, he not only was he physically transformed, but he, he had no withdrawals at all. So I, if I use this analogy, the day after Ibogaine would have been the same as if somebody had taken that person, threw him in a jail cell for 90 days, where he would have been 90 days later if he was alive and not suffering. You know, cold turkey opioid withdrawal causes post-traumatic stress disorder. You can't go through opioid withdrawal and not have PTSD in the US system. Also, in the US model right now, there is no effective way for an opiate addict to even get detoxed any, in any way. It, the law, federal law, about 10 years ago, and people don't know about this, if you check into a hospital or you check into an agency of healthcare administration certified detox, the only drug they can legally give you is buprenorphine. 
So patients, most opiate addicts right now, buprenorphine or suboxone, which leaves you incredibly depressed because it's a full agonist of um, mu receptors and antagonist of the kappa receptor. So you can't overdose on it. So it got legalized for take home use. But instead of going to the methadone lines every day, you can go to a doctor's office once a month or once every 90 days and get a prescription, but you stay addicted. So patients come to me, I want to get off Suboxone. Well, how am I going to get you off Suboxone by putting you in a detox and tapering on your Suboxone for seven days? So right now in the United States, opiate detox just does not work. I can no longer use class one or two DEA drugs to get people off class one and two drugs. I can only use the class three drug, buprenorphine, Subutex, and Suboxone. So I remember that first patient in St. Kitts, I saw nothing short of a miracle. I quickly quoted that I think this is the most important um, discovery in the history of addiction medicine. I was already board certified in addiction medicine by 1997. Um, if somebody would have told me 10 years later, I'd be practicing addiction medicine, I would have thought they, I have a psych bed for you, you know, and now I'm fully into recovery and, and dedicating my life to detoxing people. And I'm detoxing hundreds running detoxes in the United States. And back then it was really difficult. It was painful. Patients went through 90 days of post-acute withdrawal. The success rate for sustainable recovery was not that good but it was at least possible. There was a possibility I could spring you. In 2022 in the United States, there's no way I could detox you off opiates in a detox any longer. So this makes Ibogaine, I believe, the most important substance on the planet right now. So I could come here and give you hours of talk about psychedelics, LSD versus psilocybin versus 5-MeO and DMT and all these things, and I've done them all. And they all have different wavelengths and animal animes and perp and color spectrums and you know geographic allocations. But why is ibogaine so important right now? And what am I here to talk about? Ibogaine is the cure for opiate dependence. Now, many of you have heard that last year opiate deaths were up by 33%. We had 100,000 people die from opiate overdoses last year. By the time I finish speaking right now, 11 people will have died from opiate overdoses in the next hour. Every hour of every day, 11 to 12 people are dying in our country who don't want to die. They were just looking for an answer. So anybody saying that I began cures addiction, psychedelics cures addiction, I'm telling you, you're selling a lie, okay? I began is the cure for opiate dependence, thus making it the most important psychedelic of all psychedelics, because, you know, does microdosing work? Does, does I begin cure Parkinson's? Does it, you know, is neuroplasticity real? Does ketamine really cure depression? You know, these things are things I research, but, one thing I'm 100% sure of is because I've been doing this for 27 years is that flood dosing of Ibogaine that I can spring a person from an opiate dependence, literally. What would take me 90 days in a US model, I can do it 12 hours with Ibogaine. So when we were doing the study in St. Kitts, the people I was doing the study with, you know, it was very serendipitous because where are you gonna find somebody who is an ER doctor. There's nothing that could go wrong with this patient on this little island that has no medical services, no type of cardiac arrhythmia or emergency that this person like myself couldn't handle because I was a cardiologist and a consummate ER doctor. I was also a person in recovery, fully you know, into recovery, and I still am. And I'm board certified in addiction medicine. So this PhD from U of M needed me. So I spent, we would put together eight to 14 to 16 patients a month. And for about seven years, these patients paid, they paid money to go there, sometimes between eight to $14,000 to spend seven to 14 days in St. Kitts and get a flood dose of Ibogaine. But what we did, we did well. And I was told that this was going to be our gift to the world, that once we get enough patients to make the numbers statistically valid, 
that this doctor and myself are going to go in front of NIDA and the FDA. And, you know, and I believe if we would have done this, I began would probably have been legal in the United States 10 years ago. But at the end of this, and this is really not important to the story, but people got mercenary about this and started to want to own the rights to this substance. And the data never got published. And, and this is what's happening now. You know, the ultimate um, irony is, you know, profiteering off psychedelics because psychedelics themselves are plant teachers teaching proper ethics about, yeah, it's okay to make money. You just can't make it at anybody else's expense. So what I started to notice about Ibogaine, all these patients were on cardiac monitors with IVs in, because we already knew that Ibogaine had some potential as being a QT prolonging drug, but we found many other things. Flood dosing with Ibogaine causes severe bradycardia, slowing of the heart rate. It's very often I've seen patients with pulses of 16, 20, 30 while peaking on Ibogaine. Ibogaine can cause profound hypertension, Ibogaine can cause profound QT prolongation, leading to a very complex cardiac arrhythmia known as torsades de point. And patients who would take Ibogaine for other substances of abuse, specifically stimulants, crack cocaine, cocaine, methamphetamines, um, even to get off Adderall, Vyvanse, these sort of drugs, are more prone to ventricular arrhythmias due to having a hyper excitable heart. A heart that's so used to getting uh, you know, catecholamine barrage that when you stop it, their heart is very easily thrown into cardiac arrhythmias. So what happened? In what Frank Vachi called 20 years ago, I began the vast uncontrolled experiment. A lot of people who are addicts who took Ibogaine, got clean, said, I took Ibogaine, that was amazing. And like most people who do psychedelics, I remember the first time I took LSD, the next day I said, I want to give LSD to everybody alive. This is the answer of what is wrong with the planet. If everybody would have the same experience I had, everybody would be thinking properly, okay? And my, you know, not realizing that I wasn't even thinking properly, you know? Um, I've since learned that it really doesn't do that. I think I'm not so sure psychedelics cure, cure us of anything, except once you've had the psychedelic experience, you're, you're, you're held to a higher standard, being led into that sacred space. If you've seen the sacred geometry, I know I have to live my life in a certain way. Um, I can't just go along and, and you know be lazy about my life anymore because I'm gonna be responsible for my behavior when I pass over. Nobody gets out alive in this paradigm called womb to tomb. So I began clinics popped up all over the world. And most of these clinics, I would say 98% of these clinics were people with no medical training. Some of them didn't even have college degrees. Um, I've done Ibogaine so I can give Ibogaine. And what we started to notice that people were dying from Ibogaine. Um, I've reviewed many Ibogaine deaths that are in the literature. And I can tell you, I probably reviewed, I've heard from parents asking why their child died in some clinic in some third world country somewhere, you know, what, what went wrong at this clinic and why they, pro why they promised me my child would be safe and my child died at the clinic. And somebody came up with some number here, and I don't know where this, this number is not statistically valid, but, you know, risk of dying under Ibogaine in unsupervised hands is one in 300. Even let's say, I think it's, I think Ibogaine in general is a pretty safe drug if you use some precautions, but even let's say it's one in 300. If I kill one out of every 300 patients I treat, that is not acceptable. My office here in Miami Beach sees 300 patients a week. We have a very big practice. If every week one of my patients died, I think, you know, I'd be shut down very quickly. The other thing that I think went unnoticed over the last 20 years is that everybody was taking Ibogaine for, for opiates or other substances of abuse, and they were going home feeling well, but they weren't given any instructions that you've got a lifelong incurable disease that can be arrested one day at a time. And by incorporating certain spiritual principles into your life, I have to live my life a different way. I believe as a 
addiction specialist that addiction is an incurable lifelong disease that gets arrested 24 hours at a time. Every day that I get up, I say it's the best day of my life because I got up this morning and I shouldn't be here. There's dozens of reasons I should not be alive today, so my work is not done. So in my investigations, we finished this St. Kitts study and I continue to do Ibogaine treatments uh, privately and helping some clinics. Um, some of the clinics are run by physicians, some aren't. But I started to notice that if I took an alcoholic, a serious alcoholic, and I alcohol detoxed him first. So I couldn't just, he couldn't be alcohol dependent. Alcohol withdrawal unsupervised carries up to a 10% mortality. So I gave him a seven to 10 day alcohol detox and I then gave him a flood dose of Ibogaine these people didn't drink anymore. They lost their cravings for alcohol. So the fact that I began is doing something special in the brain at addiction craving sites that is other psychedelics is not doing is, is an amazing thing. And Dana knows this too, that we've seen the same thing. The success rate for like methamphetamines in the US system is about two to 3%. Every 100 people that go into detox, maybe two to 3% are clean at a year. Um, and with I flood dose of Ibogaine, we were achieving about 50% sustainable recovery rates. So what I was noticing that many patients who went to these clandestine clinics, whether they, most of them were in Mexico, they were not achieving sustainable recovery and the clinics didn't even know it because I would get these calls every day um, from patients saying, you know, I went to this clinic and it's, you know, three days later or three months later, but I relapsed. And now what do I do? Because I don't have another eight to $10,000 to go do this. So it's always been my dream that this treatment, there is a way this treatment can be done safely. I have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of treatments. I've taught this, what's known as the Camlet Safety Protocols to two other doctors who are alive in the world. And they too have done thousands of treatments. And guess what? We are the only three people in the world who can say we've done this and we've never killed a patient. Nobody has ever died. I, in my personal experience, I've never even had a patient on high doses of Ibogaine have to go to an ER. And even the rates of these other Clint, these other doctors, you know, one their rate of people having to actually go to emergency room due to an IV game related event was extremely low. I can count them on one hand, and all those patients were back the next day and they were detoxed. So what was missing? What's missing in IV game right now is the safety protocols, the affordability. And the fact that nobody are sending patients home with an aftercare plan that if you want your recovery to be sustainable, we must know about you and fill up your toolbox with the cognitive behavioral skills you need to maintain your recovery. Because people take Ibogaine, they feel, well, I'll never use again if you put the drug right in front of me and they come home. I just had a guy, 62 year old, famous doctor from New York, a geneticist who retired, moved to Miami and is smoking $300 a day of street fentanyl. And he says he took Ibogaine at a clinic in Mexico two years ago, it worked. He had 18 months clean, but he had left some fentanyl in his house because you know, as addicts do, if that stuff doesn't work, you know, I want to make sure I have a plan. So if I get back, I'm sick, you know, I have something left. And he never threw that out. And that was just sitting there waiting for him calling his name. And when he relapsed, he relapsed with a ferocious relapse. And, um, you know, being the geriatric fentanyl smoker is not a great place to be. So it was always my hope that a clinic run by physicians who have consummate expertise in advanced cardiac life support, okay? So not the fact that I'm a psychiatrist and I took an ACLS class, that's not even good enough. And, and, and that would be an amazing standard if clinics even had that. 
But no, you've actually run code blues. You've run dozens of cardiac arrests. You know how to tell torsades from VTAC. You know what to do if somebody's pulse drops. You know what to do if somebody freaks out under Ibogaine. Can you shut it down? Can you take the edge off? Um, and knowing that we're doing this treatment, we're not selling spiritual experiences here. I'm not get, in my model. I'm not giving Ibogaine to people to you know to meet God. I'm giving it to them to cured the diseases of addiction. And specifically in that whole field of all these substances of abuse that I became is amazing for, opiates, stimulants, alcohol. So I'd say opiates first, alcohol next, um, psychostimulants next. They do not, I began does not work for benzodiazepines. It does not hit GABA receptors. So if you're taking 10 milligrams of Xanax a day, you think you're gonna be free from that addiction after I began, you're not. Yet we have protocols of how do we get you off the other drugs? And then, you know, okay, you have 90 days clean off opiates, we'll start to taper the benzos. Um, this is why that aftercare plan becomes so important. So a few years ago, I kind of retired and I stay, I pretty much do clinical research for major pharmaceutical companies in the last five years of my career. And, um, been doing kind of concierge I begin treatments around the world, uh, done these treatments in many different countries, and have an incredibly good success rate, not only of not ki ever killing anybody, but my patients are clean years later, one year later, three years later, 10 years later. And interestingly enough, the I begin patients, when they do screw up, they call me very quickly, Jeff, I screwed up three days ago. I need to be treated again. They don't stay out there for six, eight, nine months because they know I don't have to go through this hellish inefficient system that's available in the US that, you know, you know, there is a solution for my problem. Now I'm gonna mention this to you. One of the things I've noticed over the years that I began is expensive. So what allows somebody who has no medical degrees, no credentials in psychiatry, medicine, or anything else, other than I've taken Ibogaine so I can give Ibogaine the right to charge somebody $10,000 for a treatment? So I always had dreamt that we could have a state-of-the-art, comfortable, loving, ethical, science-based Ibogaine clinics and make this scalable. Let's open up one, let's open up two, Let's create, let's raise the bar on addiction treatment. Let's show the world that Ibogaine is the cure for opiate dependence, that 100,000 patients in next year, 130. So next year, projecting 133,000 dead people from opiates. Now, those are the people who died. So think about, you know, 100 times of those people are, are living in the hell of being opiate dependent that not one more addict needs to die and not one person ever needs to die under Ibogaine. So I am actually happy to say that I I've, have a bunch of other people who wish to remain nameless at this time, but we will be opening the first, what I believe, of a, a, an Ibogaine clinic that has to the standards of have, has never been seen before. An began clinic with the best equipment, the best medicine, the best proven people who have decades of experience in doing safe, effective began treatments and keeping the price point ridiculously cheap. So the same as you, you'd go be charged by some guy with no credentials and some clandestine clinic and bumfuck nowhere. Now you're going to get real, you know, the best care in the world at the same price. And, and our hope is that this becomes scalable and, you know, years from now, there are Ibogaine clinics open in every country where this is legal. We have a unique model of pre-Ibogaine treatment, during Ibogaine treatment protocols, and after Ibogaine treatment protocols. I don't believe drive-through Ibogaine, you, so, you know, you speak to somebody on the telephone, you get on a plane, you fly to Mexico, and then you fly home. That's not going to, that's not the cure for, that's not the answer for sustainable recovery. Preparation for Ibogaine, proper supervision during the flood dose treatment, and every patient going home with a very custom-tailored aftercare plan in a setting, you know, unlike U.S., detox and residential treatment centers, which kind of beat people up 
listen, we're addicts. We've beaten ourselves up enough. We don't need to be beaten up. We need to be loved. Um, our clinics are going to be all about comfort and love, um, incorporating nutrition, incorporating psychotherapy, incorporating you know, some of the standard things, you know, tools available for addicts to make their recovery sustainable. And it's not something I thought I'd be doing when uh, three weeks from now is my, I'm going to be 67 years old. It only took 25 years for, the, for my dream to happen, but it's about to happen. And these clinics, it, it, they'll be known as beyond B-E-O-N-D, should be opened in two to three weeks from now. And that's exciting. So when I met Loxme, Loxme and I hit it off because I told her about the nature of my first LSD experience. And she told me about the nature of hers. And I knew Loxme got it. So everybody who's ever told me they took LSD, I've asked them, what did you see? And much, much to my surprise, above 80% of those people did not see anything that I saw, okay? Um, so I asked my patients, you know, when they tell me they've done psychedelics, you know, do you know, have you seen the sacred geometry? And if they don't know what I'm talking about, I realize, okay, you know, maybe they should have taken another 100 or 200 mics or something like that. But it allows me to see, you know, people have very different experiences under psychedelics. Um, many psychedelics have therapeutic value for many different disease processes, mental illnesses. But I am putting all my effort into the fact that we have a disease that is a killer, like cancer is a killer. 11 people die every hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year from opiate dependence, and none of them need to die if Ibogaine was available to them and a proper therapeutic model of aftercare was set up. Now, one of the things I've noticed when I look back of, of giving Ibogaine to people since 1996, how few people of color we've treated in all these different clinics. Now, I've given Ibogaine in dozens of, dozens of different countries and different sites, always in places where it was legal in association with doctors in those countries um, who, you know, so every, everything I do, I've done, I've always done in a country where it was legal, under legal protocols, with extreme due diligence, doing Ibogaine properly is labor intensive. Labs, EKGs, Holter monitors before physical exams, complete and detailed psychosocial histories, being physically present for the 24 hours of the flood dose, doctor at bedside. So if anything goes wrong, you're there, not, you know, oh, we have a doctor, but he's available by phone and he can be here in 15 minutes. No, if something goes wrong, you've got, you know, maybe 60 minutes to two or three minutes to save that person's life. So, so yes, ACLS, competent doctor needs to be by bedside at all the time. I think back, you know, had this data actually been brought out in the early 2000s as promised, that I began may have been legalized 10 years ago. And I think to myself, how many hundreds of thousands of people might be alive today if these people did not go mercenary, if they didn't think, you know, well, we've, I, you know, I, I'm the first legitimate scientist to study Ibogaine, so I should make money off this. And back then, that partner said to me, I'm not giving this information away until somebody puts $750,000 in my bank account. Back then, it was about $700,000. And today, we're $40, $50 million, and no real research has been done. So when people ask me, could you explain to me, you know, what receptor sites I began hits and where we're really, you know, the chemistry of this? Well, we can hypothesize about this. Um, can you tell me if microdosing ibogaine is a good idea? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Could you tell me if ibogaine is a cure for Parkinson's disease? Honestly, I don't know. But what I do know for 100%, 110% sure is that a flood dose of ibogaine will relieve somebody, will greatly ameliorate their opiate dependence very rapidly, consistently, and using proper safety protocols, nobody needs to die from their addiction and nobody needs to die due to desperation of Ibogaine. And I start to think about why I haven't seen people of color in these clinics is because Ibogaine was so expensive. So the people of color we had, they were usually children of wealthy people or they, my father is uh, some sort of politician or diplomat of some Caribbean island or something like that. 
My hope is that we make Ibogaine affordable, for, not just for the wealthy, for those people who have $10,000. And the same holds true for US treatment. You know, detox and rehab is extremely expensive, absurdly expensive, $30,000 a month for something that doesn't work. Um, so a where's fee program, funding for a theogenic addiction treatment program, hoping that through this AWAKE platform, we will get some major donations when we get our 501c certification, then maybe some corporate sponsors will come in. For every $100,000 that somebody gives us, we could possibly treat 12 to 13 patients. We could save 13 people's lives. Um, and it's interesting because I get calls every week and, and it, it's the last couple of weeks I've been barraged almost daily with people coming into me who need Ibogaine. They are in extremists. They are tapering Suboxone. They are buying street fentanyl. They run everything from 18 years old to 62 years old. And I, there is not a single place I feel comfortable where I can send anybody right now to take Ibogaine. And if I have to do these treatments personally, fly with them, they have to come to Miami, get the labs, I got to do the psychotherapy beforehand, then I got to go to a country where it's legal, stay by their bedside 24 hours, bring them back to Miami, make sure they're okay, do the post again. It's incredibly labor intensive and it becomes incredibly expensive because I have a practice that still exists that runs every day and needs me there. And I can make a lot more money by just being a regular doctor here in the United States. So the hope that we, we will have a mechanism where people who are not wealthy, where people of color, where people of lower socioeconomic means have a road to safe, effective Ibogaine treatment for the first time ever is extremely exciting to me, as is the fact that, you know, the first, the first truly world-class, you know, Ibogaine clinic will be opening in the month of February. Um, we are raising the bar. We are raising the standard of care to a level that's never been seen before. From all the knowledge that we've gained from 27 years of doing thousands and thousands of treatments to do this extremely safely and not counting success as the patient goes home and says, I'm not an opiate withdrawal, but success when I speak to that patient a year later and he says to me, I'm still clean and I'm loving my life. Um, you know, I have a saying, clean and miserable uses again. Our job is to put the joy back into people's lives, that they get up every day of their life, no matter what they're facing. I have cancer, I have COVID, I have no money, I've lost a child, whatever it might be, and say to themselves, I woke up this morning, it's the best day ever. Because you know why? 100,000 opiate addicts didn't wake up last year, the next morning. So I'd like to say, you know, not one more opiate death, not one more Ibogaine death. Um, and I'm going to take some questions from anybody now if they'd like to ask. Um, thanks. Thanks for listening to me.